Hello. Yeah, I'm going to have a training tomorrow uh, in the morning, and I'm going to give you a short overview of what you can expect or give you some kind of motivation why you would want to go to that training. Uh, so what can you do with it? What can you do with PySite and what can you do with uh, QML? You can create cool-looking desktop applications. So if you're looking for a way to create a very interesting, uh, very dynamic UIs uh, for the desktop, for example, uh, on your laptops or also on some computers, you can do that. And you can also create touch-friendly mobile apps, which is what uh, QML is all about. So there's special support for doing things like finger scrollable lists, stuff like that, uh, multi-touch support. All this is included in QML, and you can define the UI using some declarative language. So uh, that's also very nice to, to use once you get used to it. Uh, and using PySide, you can access all of these features from Python. So you don't have to uh, code C++, which is the native language of Qt. You can use it from Python directly. Uh, I said mobile apps for which devices? Uh, for example, one of these devices could be the N900, which uh, has been out for some years now. It's running MIMO. It's a Linux-based operating system, so you basically have an X server on there. And it also supports Qt and QML, of course, and it runs uh, Python. So you can uh, use Python on this device. You also have an X term, so if you feel the urgent need to do some Python coding, for example, on the bus, you can just uh, take it out and uh, code something. Of course, it supports also PyGDK. This, this device. Uh, then there's the N950, which is the developer device. Uh, it also supports uh, Python and QML. It doesn't support GTK anymore, but you can do uh, QML UIs with it. And there's the recently announced N9, which is also uh, running the successor of MIMO. It's called Amigo Harmaton, which is basically a Debian-based uh, mobile Linux distribution. Uh, are there any other targets? apart from these three devices. Uh, for Android, basically, Python support is already there, so you can have uh, Python for Android. And Qt is already ported as well. The problem is just that uh, nobody yet packaged PySite, uh, basically put Python and Qt together on Android and make it so. But basically, Python runs there and Qt runs there, so it's just a matter of time that somebody takes these two parts, uh, and gets together, and then you can do PySite UIs on Android as well. Uh, and of course, Migo, which is the uh, Intel, Intel's uh, mobile operating system platform. Uh, Migo is on TVs, IVI, that means in vehicle infotainment, as far as I know. So it's uh, some devices in cars, handsets, tablets, uh, netbooks, and so on. But of course, for Migo, there are no real devices out on the market yet, but it's expected that at some point there will be. And then you can definitely run uh, high side and QML apps on these devices. Uh, desktop platforms, Mac OS 10, Windows, and Linux are all supported. Of course, some of you uses any kind of BSD or some other weird operating system or like non-mainstream operating system. As long as Qt runs on there, there's a good chance that PySite and Qt, uh, QML will also run on there. So basically, it should work for you. Uh, now for some examples, this screenshot is not a QML app, but that's uh, the old GTK or PyGK UI of Gporror, which is a podcast client that I wrote. And for the, the new version, also for mobile devices and so on, so on, I decided to take this UI. I took the same backend and just replaced the, the PyGK UI with the QML UI. And the result looks like that. It's very touch-friendly, uh, non-standard or non-classic uh, user interface elements. It's uh, designed for finger usage. It's made so that UI elements are big enough that you can use it on a, a small device. I can later demo it on, on the device and also on the computer so that you can see how it works in practice. And again, uh, this is the, the backend is written in Python, and I'm reusing all the Python code that I wrote for the GTK application. I'm just reusing that for the QML UI. So I just have to replace the UI, basically. Uh, another example uh, is Panucci, which is a Futurama reference. I think I should mention it's in Italy, because there's some soccer player, I guess. Anyway, that's the GTK plus UI. It's basically a, an audiobook and podcast player. Uh, and then somebody wrote a Qt UI that basically looks the same as the GTK UI. Not much difference. 
that's using the queue widgets uh, UI elements. So that's not using QML, it's using Qt with all the classic UI elements that you can use. So that looks like your standard test view of standard buttons, uh, progress bars, checkboxes, drop downs, all the stuff that you know from your normal desktop operating system. Then again, uh, you can do your own QML UI. It might look that pretty. You just, I mean, uh, a developer has designed this UI, but if you can hire some kind of graphics musician, they can create great graphics for UI, and then it also works great on touch-based devices. Again, in this case, all three UIs, so PyGDK, the Qt UI with QWidgets, and the QML UI use the same Python backend, so you have the same code base, and depending on where you want your application to run, for example, on a desktop, you might prefer some classic UI, and on mo mobile platforms or tablets, you might want to use a QML UI. Uh, yeah, live demo. Let's see if this works. Um, I'm just going to run this on my computer now. So that's a GTK UI. You see classic user interface elements, very much in, uh, much information because I have the space on the screen, uh, scroll bars, context menus, stuff like that, menu bar, and then And then, using the same code base, I just have uh, a runtime switch that enables the QML UI. I can have the QML UI. They have a very fluent, very fast uh, user interface. Of course, here there are some different, uh, like different requirements. For example, I have cool animations. Uh, there is no right click because I don't really have a right mouse button with a touch UI, obviously. Uh, cool animations. I can play videos. Play them full screen. All these transitions are mostly done uh, inside the declarative UI. So I just say, uh, define how the UI behaves. I don't have to take care about uh, doing timers, doing stuff like uh, moving elements around. I just anchor some elements at some points of the screen. And when it changes, then the UI changes also. Also do like audio, get great animations. So most of this stuff already runs in QML. It does not need to, uh, to call back to Python for most of the stuff except for the data. So all the animations are fluid because they basically run inside C++ or native code. And just for the, uh, just for the data and callback, stuff like that, for storing the data that I modified in the UI, I just call back into Python and do stuff. Uh, the other application that I showed uh, this audiobook player as a GTK UI, just plays some stuff. You can have the Qt UI, that's basically the same QWidget based UI. It's not using GTK, it's using uh, Qt. But again, Qt on Ubuntu by default uses the GTK theming, so you don't really see a difference here. But it uses a different uh, UI tool code, and then the QML stuff. Look a bit weird here. Yeah, it's, it's basically a big canvas, so you see the, the white uh, border around here. You can have some cool lists. You can do about, so you can have many animations, stuff like that. It works a bit different, and you can create very, very interesting UIs as long as you have either some kind of uh, skills to do the graphics on your own, or you have some people to do the graphics for you. Um, yeah. For example, what I can also do is I have some prepared some small example, a translucent window, which is also something you can do with uh, Qt and QML. And some small QML code that basically shows some logo, which you will shortly see, and uh, rotate it. So here I'm resetting the rotation and making it, uh, making it take a bit longer from Python. So there's a Python thread running uh, telling the QML, please restart your animation uh, and increase the duration. And I printed it out on standard out. So that's something you can easily do. And you can see it's very fast because the rendering, again, is done on the C++ side. OK, so I've got some, some code here. Uh, I've got uh, N950 here uh, that I hooked up using a USB and it's using USB networking. So I can SSH into the device from my laptop. Okay. 
I'm now connected to the device. I can now copy over the EuroPython logo and the translucent uh, example device, SCP, no problem. Um, SSH again into the device. Have a look at what files are in there. I'm going to um, use the SSH connection to start the example here. And um, I'm switching to the webcam. I'm showing this to you here. It's basically running on the device, the same example, without any modifications. Sorry for the crappy quality, but I think you can kind of get the point what's possible. Okay, so. And of course I can, while the application is running full screen on the device, I can still uh, see all the, I, I still have the SSH session on my laptop, so I can see all the debugging output on my computer, which is fine for doing uh, full screen applications. It's very easy for debugging. And again, uh, what I usually do when I develop, I just have some uh, rsync set up so that I develop on my laptop using a, a full-blown Vim, uh, then just rsync everything over. I have a separate uh, SSH terminal open and then just run the example there. Uh, of course, it does have VI installed, so I could just uh, edit the code there on the device, either via SSH or by just using the device itself, which is kind of cumbersome, but it does work, and edit the code there and try it out. Of course, this also saves you from downloading uh, several gigabytes of SDKs and emulators, stuff like that. You can just uh, use your Python environment on your laptop, copy the stuff over, try it on the device without any problems, which is quite nice, I think. Okay, so I hope I got you interested. We still have lots of time, so we can uh, show some either some uh, questions or some examples. I can try some live coding. Basically. Uh, what well, you should not forget, uh, tomorrow in the morning, from 9 to uh, 13 o'clock, uh, in the Pizza, Pizza Margarita uh, room, there's this training session where we're going to kind of try out some of the examples. Um, I get you started, uh, how to develop as these uh, applications, how you can install everything is on this URL. So if you have been here for some days, you know that the internet connection is not that reliable. And you, it could be that depending on which uh, OS you are using that you have to download some stuff. So please check out the URL if you can today. Uh, download all the dependencies. There's instructions posted there. Oops. So basically it tells you download Qt if you are on OS 10 or Windows, it's optional for Windows because I have been told that uh, the Qt binaries that you need for running these examples are already included in the PySat binaries. And on Linux, obviously, if you have a proper distribution that does dependency management, you obviously get all the things you need. Uh, then you can get PySat for your platform. You can either use the binary package for Mac OS 10, Windows, or, the, or there's even a Ubuntu PPA to get the latest version of PySat because it's a very um, rather new project. Uh, if you have another distribution that doesn't have any binary packages, you can use the build scripts, which is basically just a set of uh, scripts to build PySite from source because there are some components like the binding skip generator and so on. But there's a readme file which uh, instructs you how to do it. That's for PySite. Uh, then you can download some example code, for example, the PySite QML examples. Uh, you can also try out the cheap other code that I just demoed here. It's all open source and available from this uh, Git repository. And there are some more Py official PySet examples uh, for you to try out, which is not just QML, but also like the QWidget based stuff, because PySet obviously also uh, supports the QWidget modules and other modules from Qt. But for, for the training session, it's just PySet and QML, because I think that's what's the interesting part for this training. And there's also a forum market PPA if you want to have the Qt Mobility QML components. You need this, for example, for uh, Cheap Hotter. So, uh, what Qt Mobility QML components provide are, for example, the multimedia stuff. So by default, QML doesn't provide any multimedia stuff, like playing videos or playing audio. With the Qt Mobility QML components, you basically just say, I want to have some audio here or some video here. 
this is the URL of the file, either of the local file name or the URL, and QML will take care of uh, loading the file and playing it there, and you can then also set some properties. And if you want, we can try this out tomorrow as well. And there's some short Migo Python tutorial which basically explains the same stuff that we do here uh, in text form. So if you want to be prepared for tomorrow and have many di difficult questions, just uh, get on this page. Again, the URL is listed here. And yeah, I think we can start with some questions. And if there's a lack of questions, I can do some more demos. I will leave the URL up here, so just write it down and download the depends if, if you're interested in doing the training tomorrow. Any question? Earlier you mentioned uh, running uh, uh, writing programs for uh, Android and running uh, both Python and Qt on it, and both of them not being packaged and so on. But what's the status of uh, Python on Android right now? Uh, Python on Android already works. So there's the uh, scripting layer for Android project, which basically uh, adds support for all the scripting languages like Python, I think JavaScript, some others. Ruby could be, yeah, I guess. Uh, stuff like that. It's a, uh, to Android, but basically you don't have really any possibility of doing UIs. You can do stuff like dialogues or progress dialogues, stuff like that. And yeah, you can do HTML views and then communicate from your Python script to HTML view. But that's not something that you might want to do. And it's also probably not as slow as doing some other UI stuff. Uh, if you're doing the, if you want to go the Qt route, there's Qt already, which means that you can do C++ applications uh, for Android with this uh, Necessitas port. It's already open here. Basically, ne Necessitas is uh, Qt for Android. And it also includes support for uh, IDE. So you can even use the Qt creator and even debug your applications that's running, for example, in the Android emulator. And this stuff also works on real Android devices. And the problem right now is that uh, you can't use Qt and Python, but they're available separately. It's just a matter of time that someone basically takes care of compiling PySide for Android using the NDK and then getting stuff playing together with this Qt port. Answer the question or any other questions? There is some problem uh, if I um, have installed uh, PyQt. Uh, there is some problem uh, compatibility. I have installed uh, PyQt on my PC and uh, I want to install uh, PySide. There is some problem. Uh, no, it shouldn't be a problem because they have different uh, package names. Okay. So it's. it's uh, so uh, the PySide packages are from PySide stuff like that, and I think for PyQt it's from PyQt something. Yeah, uh, I'm not. You can't use, of course, for, you can't subclass PyQt objects and do <laughs> stuff like that. But and there is also on the, on the PySide wiki some instructions for uh, porting PyQt code to PySide because in in PyQt you, as far as I know, use PyQt signal, and in PySet it's just signal. Not like that. So minor differences. Any other questions? Yeah. What do you think about the the Nokia move on uh, Windows Phone Seven? Uh, I think that there's no future for uh, for Migo and so on. So why I? What, what is the motivation about using this platform uh, with this uh, market which is uh, divided in three pieces from Apple, Google with Android, and Microsoft with Nokia and so on in uh, Windows Phone Seven? For, for me personally, mean yes. Uh, well, the thing is, that's the only platform right now where I can easily port between the mobile platform and, for example, your desktop machine. Because for, for iOS, as far as I know, you basically have to write your application from scratch using all the iOS things. And even if it's possible to port it, you would only have your application on Mac OS X. You wouldn't be able to port your iOS application to Windows or Linux. Uh, for Android, 
it's basically the same thing. It's using its very own custom UI stuff, which probably makes very good sense for mobile applications because there's some very cool uh, lifecycle stuff in there. But again, you can't really port your Android application to the desktop or vice versa. You can't really take a desktop application and port it to Android. Uh, with this, you can easily create basically a Linux desktop application and with some modifications, for example, you basically have to replace the UI most of the time, but everything else can, the same. So it can stay the same. So you have an X server on there, you have a normal shell, you can do SSH into it, which is kind of the thing that I think interesting from the platform. Yeah, it, it's right that it's kind of sad that they are going a different route, so. But maybe there's some other window coming up. I think there was a question over there. Do you know of any efforts to make bindings for either PySide or PyQ to, to PyPy? Again? Bindings for PySide or PyQ or even some other GUI to PyPy. PyPy. Oh, um, I'm not aware of any plans. Uh, I've been to the PyPy talk, which has just been in the other room, and they said that they provide some support for C, Python, C extensions. Uh, so yeah, it could be that it just works. I'm not sure. Uh, it would be interesting to try out. Um, but then again, uh, most of the time spent in these GUI applications uh, is probably just in the in the UI rendering, which is done by Qt anyway, in native, natively compiled code. And you just do some application logic uh, in your Python code most of the time, or reading data, shuffling data around. So I'm not sure if that specific use case uh, benefits from PyPy that much. But I'm not sure. I haven't tried it out, so it could be that it's really great and that we should try to get it there. But yeah, I'm not aware of any plans. Um, I'm confused with the QML. I heard before, I know a little uh, bit, but uh, I have my doubts that I heard that for the uh, Qt uh, version 5, and there will be a big change that you will have to do less, uh, okay, um, less programming, and you will uh, use more uh, scripting. I'm not sure if it was with the. Uh, I heard that maybe you have to do more JavaScript, so I don't know if QML. Uh, QML um, not sure uh, QML if it's uh, the language that it's expected to replace or to be very important in version 5, or it's the JavaScript, I'm not sure. Uh, it's from the architecture point of view, I'm not sure if I... Uh, basically, Qt5, they try to uh, move, the, like, right now with Qt4, it's that uh, all the, even in QML, you use most of the Q widget uh, modules to render the stuff. You have QPaint and stuff like that. Uh, for Qt5, uh, as far as I understand it, they try to move to the Qt scene graph, which is basically uh, taking advantage of all the uh, hardware acceleration that you had in recent hardware uh, on desktop as well as a mobile, and then put the Q widget stuff on top of that. So that for QML stuff, you basically run QML uh, more or less directly without the overhead of the big Qt GUI module. module. Um, where is the internet now? And and the question was if, if QML replaces everything, or? Well, uh, my question is, it's, uh, QML is the part of Qt that will become, will be, uh, become more important yeah. uh, in, version, uh, in the version 5 of Qt, because I, I knew that there was going to be a big framework, and they wanted to make this transition. And I heard, OK, Qt script, or Qt, uh, Qt uh, QML. I was not sure which one was the technology part that was going to. Uh, I, I push think forward. QML. And if you've tried QML, as soon as you tried it, you will see that it, it's very easy to do the declarative stuff. So for for UIs especially, it, it does get used. Uh, it does take some time getting used to it. Yeah. So when you come from the classical UI uh, kind of paradigm where you instantiate buttons, then you set the text on buttons, then you uh, do all kinds of different stuff. Just uh, big chunks of code, just dealing with changing the UI 
and enabling buttons stuff like that. It, it's just done in a very declarative way in, in QML. And there's also, as far as I know, a QML desktop widgets. Sure if I find it right now. Uh, there is uh, an effort going on, an experimental effort to uh, provide desktop widgets for QML so that you can write applications that just look like your normal Q widget application using QML and using all the, the features of QML. So let's thank Thomas for this teasing talk.